All right, so welcome to another episode of Gamers, Devs, and Scholars. I'm your host, Javier, and joining me here today are... Ava. Uh, Jonas. <laughs> Sucker prize! And Ladium. Oh, Ida, you're muted. Ida. No worries. It's also our sound check. <laughs> so today we're going to comment a very interesting game that the guys voted on, and that is Paradise Killer. There's been a murder in Paradise. But more interestingly, I believe, there is this distinction between what can be facts and what can be truth. So. Um, we have uh, different kinds of perspectives here and I really love to open this discussion by saying um, were you guys surprised by uh, the tone of the game maybe because it is a murder mystery however I believe it has a very distinct tone what do you guys think? It reminds me a lot like, um... Um... No, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, um, I, I've, I've played a lot of games like uh, Ace Attorney and Danganronpa and things like that, and it had a lot of that same kind of feel to me, um, but with a, a like vaporwave twist on it. Uh, but in terms of like it having the, the humorous elements while there's a brutal murder that you're investigating, uh, it was kind of similar in that sense, and same with like games like Zero Escape. Uh, so it, it kind of reminded me a lot of those. And it's, and it's interesting, Anne, because uh, you mentioned that we have these references in, on other, in other games. Uh, myself, I know of Phoenix Wright, but I haven't played it. Uh, I did get uh, similarities from literature, but uh, we will mention those in, in a moment. Uh, you were going to mention it. I was just wondering um, what you meant by, by tone. Because I think it's, I think it's interesting. I'd like to know more about how you use tone in um, in gaming. Because in literature, obviously, it has a very, it's it's a very specific thing. So it's about style, exactly. uh, for example. Uh, so is it is it? Would you say it's the same? Is that how you're using it? Yeah. Well, uh, that's one of the beauties, I believe, of gaming. We are still <laughs> determining. Um, our terms and how we approach our games. Personally, as a game writer, I also use tone in that way, the style of the writing. Uh, however, I, I have met colleagues who use tone even to describe games that are very minimal or have no, no text uh, at all. So that's a great point. Uh, at least here, I would use it to describe how funny it is how, in contrast with the previous title that we uh, analyzed, this one was edited. <laughs> there was, uh, at least for me, there was more unity even in how long the texts were. Like, you always had to start by establishing the personality of, these, of each of these characters, making them memorable with, with a personality that would have this mixture of um, comedy and some other element, but always I believe comedy was was present. What are you thinking? Uh, yeah, of? yeah, Ava, go ahead. Uh, it's not like most murder mysteries, it's like on board games, they briefly describe the area. This one goes a step further, is describing backstory of the syndicate, uh, the gods, even some uh, uh, periods in in the past, like the Great Betrayal. The, the war with the god hunters. Yeah, Even that's, some a, of the gods are... that's a great point. The lord, then, you mean, Ava? Yeah. Definitely. Maybe you would like uh, to go further into that because you're, you're such an expert in cosmic horror. Did you perceive that the lore in this game uh, helped it to make it distinct, let's say, from Phoenix Wright? Uh, I haven't played Phoenix Wright, but uh, the very lore is very upfront. It introduces you the very, uh, the very setting. 
especially when you start the game, it introduces you every to lean up to the point. Uh, the gods, it, they focus on a couple. The primary one is Silent Goat, who is the first, the holy catalyst. This god is responsible for for the mortality and the ability to create new islands mm -hmm. in the world. And personally, I appreciate it that there is this complex lore. However, it's like in many uh, different works, it's not shared in a massive way at the beginning, but it's split, I believe, in a very friendly way. Myself, I even had trouble keeping up with the names of these characters, even though they are <laughs> memorable, I believe, uh, in terms of character design and even on, on their names, I still had so much trouble. So I was thankful that I could more or less separate, like, this is the lore, these are the characters, and up to a point, I believe, uh, we have freedom that we can solve this game, even if we do not understand much of the lore. No, the lore is in tangent to it. Mm -hmm. It is very rich lore, however. Welcome, yeah. Bobcat! <laughs> hey! So we were mentioning yeah. uh, first uh, the tone, now the lore, uh, Iro had a great question about, in games, what we understand, what do we understand by the term um, tone? Do you want to chip in? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, so, to me, like, what tone is... Tone is going to be sort of how we feel about certain aspects of the narrative or the art style. Like, Paradise Killer is kind of a weird thing in that it has a very sort of perky upbeat tone to like the music and a lot of the art but it's a very dark game when it comes to the lore and things like that even the very concept of the islands is a very strange and dark concept to a lot of people um but i think that it it works in paradise killer's case largely because of the kind of fantastical elements of it the idea that this is kind of normal and so i i like the idea that the tone of the game based on, again, the music and the art style, makes things feel alien, but also kind of lightens the mood a little bit. It keeps the game from becoming very dreary and from becoming very depressing, which it could quite easily be. You're dealing with a murder case and you're dealing with, again, lore that involves massacring thousands of people in order to satiate the gods. And so it'd be really easy for that to be kind of a downer. Um, but yeah, so I, I genuinely enjoy the tone, and I like that kind of juxtaposition of having a very perky, upbeat art style to the, the, the relatively dark subject matter. Definitely. Uh, can can ahead, I throw James. that back to Iro? Because, like, personally, I like what's I don't really have a good definition. I'm like, I don't I don't really know in my top at the top of my head like what's the difference between I don't know atmosphere and tone. So, like, yeah. Do you have a good definition for games, uh, or is there like what is the like traditional definition for maybe movies? If, if you have anything to say, uh, Iro, did you did you understand the question? Yes. I think so, so are you talking? So you're talking about literature? What the definition is? Yeah. Is yeah. What, yeah. Well, I would say that it has to do with text, right? So. Uh, the style and the, um, uh, the the motifs and the the literary tropes used, for example, uh, in romantic uh, romantic tone would be um, you would you would encounter very often um, an identification of the individual with nature. For instance, this would be a pattern. Um, uh, gothic tone, obviously, you would have um, uh, you know the oppressive kind of. Um, um, perhaps urban uh, landscape, the moody weather, so all of these would be specific tonal elements. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is that with there, there are specific elements that make you feel a certain way because you all, when you, when you kind of address tone, you all spoke about how the game makes you feel which isn't necessarily the first thing i guess that we would say in literature that this book makes me feel in this and this in such and such such a way and this is what tone is but in the game it definitely comes into play um that it doesn't get you down for example even though it has this kind of 
there is a gothic appeal, I guess, to the whole the murder and the blood, and you know, there are gothic elements, but also not. So yeah, I guess, I guess that would be a, a, a juxtaposition that it's not so much, it's not just about the text, even though it's a it's a textually heavy game, but it's also about the the artwork and how you feel when you experience it. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, very interesting to me, uh, you know, how you mentioned that in books we don't usually analyze them by saying I felt this way. In games that is so common and uh, we could use as a comparison paintings. In paintings we also use a lot I felt, especially starting I believe in the 19th century up to now, um, when we are exploring how the individual feels in, in front of our work. So it is curious, and we don't have, I don't have right now, um, clearly understood why in games the, the sensation, the, the individual feelings are probably more important for us to understand those. Because even, I believe, in movies, uh, it, it is not as common as in games to say that. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, yeah, very useful distinction that you mentioned. I, I think that the reason why you see it more in games is because it's a, an interactive form of media, whereas other forms of media are passive. You have agency over a character. You are performing the actions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that that's why it's a whole lot easier to sort of interpret things in an emotional way as opposed to a more passive form of media where you are watching the things occur. Yeah, that is a great point uh, because, for example, I adore dancing. And yeah, definitely, you, you very easily describe, uh, I dance with my girlfriend, we dance and we felt like whatever you want. So I believe that you're right on, on the point, uh, Popka, that it has to do with our agency and interaction. Mm -hmm. There's a quote that I really like um, by Warren Robinette, who did um, Adventure on the Atari, that um, he, he talks about um, how people embody the avatar when they're playing video games. And he, he's mentioning, and I'm not going to get this quote exactly right, because that would be difficult. Um, but essentially, he says that, you know, when, when a player is playing a game and they run into a wall, they say, I ran into the wall, even though they are aware that it's not them actually doing it. Yeah. And um, so th there is an idea even, you know, in, in the 80s that you become that character, even though you know you're not that character, you are that person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it gives it a different level than say like a book or a, a movie because you are an active participant, even if it's not actually you. But, uh, and I think that it's- point, then. I think it's cool that that exists even independent of whether or not you have like a character creator or independent of whether it like, even whenever you're playing something like Uncharted where it is always third person, you're always controlling Nathan Drake, he always behaves the same way. When you mess up, you still take responsibility for that or you still feel like, oh, I did X or Y, even though you're playing as somebody different and it's very clear that that's the case. Definitely. Actually, there I have a good immersion. example of that. Um, in, in, um, in Skyward Sword, hi Max, uh, you you have these, uh, or is, no, it's Twilight Princess. In Twilight Princess, um, you have the, the dual claw, uh, claw shots, mm -hmm. and there's also like a temple in the sky, and uh, there are many, many times that I would be using those and I would fall with Link, and it's very upsetting to me because I'm terrified of heights. And so even though I am not there, and it's not me falling from a massive height into the sky and, you know, probably dying a horrible death and then getting respawned. Uh, like, it's still very upsetting to me because I see, like, the falling happening. And so my brain just immediately freaks out because of the height aspect. And it's not me, it's Link. Yeah. Definitely, well, and, it's so and powerful. Not, I was going to say, not, not to go too far into the weeds here, but you'll sometimes see games now being used as treatment for uh, things like phobias or stuff like that. And it's kind of interesting how even whenever you're not wearing a VR headset, like, for example, I was reading one time about an app that basically you hold your phone in your hand face up and it projects a spider in your hand. And people had a very, yeah, they had a very visceral response to that. But you can actually use that in a very sort of safe environment where you can always just turn off the screen and the spider is gone to treat certain phobias or things like that. Or 
Um, like there was a game that circulated for a while that was called uh, Autism, and basically it, it was um, simulating not really autism, but more uh, social anxiety aspects of it and certain kind of uh, developmental issues within that sort of spectrum. And it, it used, but basically you're on a playground and whenever you would get close to kids, the screen would go very staticky and you would start to get a lot of noise and the noise would start to blow out. And it was kind of a simulation of how it feels to be sort of alienated or to have that anxiety. And so it was interesting using that sense of immersion to sort of convey and, and teach people about what these certain things were like and also to use them to treat certain conditions. It is a very powerful sensation and I believe it's one of the hopes of our medium. Eventually, I'm pretty sure that we'll benefit from Ido's expertise or curiosity on the topic for a game, if possible, in the future. It's very easy when you play video games that you end up putting in your own version of your own perspective from your point of view, like with like, I have arachnophobia, I despise going into areas that may have spiders. But that's the wonderful thing about video games. It's your own perspective, from your own pe personal point of view, even if you're playing as a different character that's not even close to you. Definitely. And in terms of that, uh, I sometimes complain about games not making use of this ability for you to confront your fears enough. Uh, I, I see a lot of titles that are, let's say, escapism. We can have all kinds of entertainment, but I believe if we've had plenty of those, it would be interesting to use the immersion aspect of games in order to face our fears or develop skills in a more uh, intentional way, I believe. Circling back to that, I appreciate it that Paradise Killer um, asked me, uh, made me ask, what is truth? What is my truth? Um, from the very get-go, there is a version of events. And I enjoy that since I'm not shooting at things, since I'm not platforming all around. Basically, the main goal is just uh, for me to establish what is my version of events. And I believe that that is, at least for me, somewhat refreshing because, again, I have not finished Phoenix Wright, but I believe there is one version of events, right, in those in those games, and Yes. And here, there is an opportunity for you to even start a trial, uh, in, I believe, even from the beginning. So you can say, this is my version of events. I only research until I have like two, three dots of evidence that more or less make a, a theory. Or maybe I want to see all of the aspects of this, uh, of this island, as many of you may have done. <laughs> Myself, I only played the uh, five hours that we uh, agreed on, but I, I, I'd love your thoughts about this. What do you think? I love your own truth. that the truth seemed to be contingent on the personality that you would create through your answers. Wow. So you would get specific um, information from the people that you interacted with, depending on whether you were rude or whether you wanted to flirt or whether you... Um, they annoyed you and you wanted to, you didn't want to talk to them for, for a long time. And I think it was, obviously this happens in, in many, many different games, but it wasn't so clear cut. It wasn't, you know, the, the two answers wouldn't necessarily yield opposite results. Perhaps you would get the same information in the end, but you would be a different person or, or not. Well, I don't know, because I didn't play every version, but... Um, I thought that was that was interesting. The fact that um, next to every answer, there was the feeling whether the character was annoyed, uh, love dies, whether she was annoyed or whether she was um, uh, in an investigative mood. I thought that was that was a fun thing. And even yeah, the pose would that change. Sometimes, like, the sprite would change. Yeah, the the sprite would change depending on the mood, and so you basically make your own version of lady when you're playing by making these yeah. choices and you shape her personality and how she would respond to these events which is uh, somebody tell me 
Go ahead, can, Jonas. Can somebody just tell me right now, is there any kind of, like, penalty somehow, like, if you, if you like, get the wrong dialogue or something, is there anything that, like, kind of happens because of it? Or is it just, like, because I, I need to know. <laughs> I, I haven't loaded a single time, so I, I need to know. So far, I haven't found, like, let's say, a cost of doing the dialogues in the wrong way. I I'm not sure there is a wrong way to do the dialogues. It, it, it's usually advantageous to be nice to people in the game. Not always, but usually. But uh, otherwise, as far as I know, there really isn't. Because one of the central themes of the game is that the evidence kind of speaks for itself. That that you could reconstruct the narrative. And so, in a way, it almost doesn't matter what they say if you construct the narrative from the evidence. Now, you can get certain pieces of evidence by talking to them in particular ways. But at the end of the game, like, um, it, it, I'm I'll avoid any type of massive spoilers for anybody who wants to go back and play it again. But there were, uh, it, basically there was a character who I really liked who wound up being involved in it and it subverted my expectations of what was going on at the end. But at the end of the day, the evidence sort of pointed to, to that character. And so even though I didn't, like they gave me one uh, type of story, I kind of saw through what they were saying. And so I was able to, decide in that case whether or not I wanted to uh, uh, accuse them at the trial. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it, like I said, in that case, I, I don't know that it actually does matter all that much. Um, it, like, I don't think that there's a wrong response. You just might not mm -hmm. get the same type of information. Yeah, that's one of the aspects that originally drove me to this title. I attended a master class with Sam Barlow of Silent Hill and of uh, Her Story. And he mentioned that we've had a trend in story-driven games of branching storylines. You would uh, choose a dialogue option or you would do something in a game and you would end with one of three different endings, five different endings. But he mentioned that that was slowly changing. He himself had tried to do something different in his games and he uh, included as an example Paradise Killer because we don't have the fail states that demand you to know, go back and you have to talk to this character in this way. As Bobcat was saying, you may not get the exact same information, but you can still have a different ending and it, it should still be enjoyable and, and different. We analyzed before even a game that takes this uh, crazier to, to a more intense um, length and that is uh, Disco Elysium, where it is even more interesting to do the worst possible things, like fail at karaoke. It's so funny to see how a character sings horribly. It's better than how he sings correctly, let's say. Um, so, so Jonas, uh, I wonder, um, were you a bit like worried that maybe you would not get the right dialogues at points in the game? Uh, yeah, because um, I'm just like I'm, I guess I'm, I, I'm uh, have been conditioned a little exactly. bit. Uh, exactly. As gamers, you usually lose something, you know, if you do something wrong in games. Yeah. And I was like, I just got everything correctly. <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was. Start over. Sorry, uh, Shelly, can you repeat that? It's, uh, it's like when you mess up really bad and you're just like, I must start over. This is unacceptable. Yeah. Or whenever you're mean to, to your fairy character and you'll be like, time to start over. I hurt his feelings. <laughs> now I'm sad. <laughs> Personally, I, I, I see... Did... Go ahead, Jonas. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I did check. I did. I did die once. I did kill myself once or twice just to see if like the clues and stuff stayed. Uh, oh my god! I didn't know you could kill yourself. Just, just fell in the just, water just, so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I have been Commit throwing myself from the craziest places, but I, I thought I was invulnerable. That doesn't hurt, but two two seconds in the water apparently, and that's it. She's dead. So. Yeah. What? Oh, Lady yeah, Love Dice doesn't swim? What? Yeah, she, tr trying she to, just sinks. Trying to navigate out by Dr. Doom Jazz's yacht, yeah. I would constantly fall off the pier. Yep. Um, yeah. And then it would respawn me away from him, and so then I would have to try and walk the pier again. That yep. wasn't great. Yeah, and I also just hated taking that elevator, so I would just try and like jump straight to the pier, and mm -hmm. 
sometimes that did go well for me, but then I would make the jump and then go on the pier and then fall in the water and cool. <laughs> I wound up hundred percenting it. And so by the end I was just like, yeah, fast travel. I don't care. I've got like 50 blood crystals. Let's just do this. Yeah. Of same. <laughs> yeah. I have been hoarding the crystals so far because I haven't played as much as, uh, as you guys. But it, it, just this point now gives me a different perspective on the game. I really thought that I was invulnerable because I haven't uh, fallen into the, the water. So I, I had a very strong sensation that, yeah, this is paradise. And the, the challenges are not related to death. And maybe they're, they're not the biggest challenges, right? Because that can only happen like occasionally. But it, it did just change my perspective that I can actually die in this game. I didn't know. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the penalty for death is relatively minor. So it's not sure. like it, it, it's not going to set you back any. But I mean, like the concept of the game is you have these immortal beings who got killed. And so I it, it, I don't know that that's just it, it, that's just an interesting thing to me is, is the idea of trying to solve this murder of people who are incapable of, of dying Apparently, of natural yeah. causes, yeah. Apparently, uh, however, as Avatar was mentioning at the beginning, the the distinction between the lore and what I was uh, playing was very present for me in this immortality aspect because while I did hear that the Syndicate had been killed, the most powerful beings at least that are on the island, uh, since we start the game by myself being thrown out of my apartment uh, for isolation and nothing happened and constantly in the in the island i also did that and nothing happened i would not get killed i i for a moment thought myself really as i'm just another member of paradise that cannot be killed i really got immersed and i forgot for a moment that the lore has exactly established that no a lot of these beings have been killed I completely forgot about it. Yeah. yeah it, it, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, that that does genuinely draw on like classical literature and things like that, though, where you have gods who are immortal and yeah, it, they could jump off of whatever they wanted and not die. But if you stab them with a particular type of sword or you exactly. you know do whatever, then it's yeah, it's it's gonna kill them. Once. And so yeah, like I, yeah. Mm -hmm. You were going to there's that. one particular character, and I'm not going to spoil who it is, but there is a particular character who dies from falling. And I was trying to figure out how in the heck they actually died via falling because the fall damage is turned off in Paradise. Um, so it, I still haven't figured that out. You know, but that um, is a thing. I, I, maybe I go maybe through a theory since. Go ahead, uh, Shelly. I'm thinking if you had fall damage, but that person died via falling, maybe it's something that is supposed to happen, regardless of what you did in option. Okay, but that person and that you mentioned who died, did he die in this island or did he die in previous islands? One no, he three. died in this island. Okay, okay. Mm. That character, that, that character I will spoil very little he didn't die from fall damage <gasps> the blood oh. thickens oh my god how many of you have finished there. the game <laughs> i finished it but i didn't see anything about that okay okay i have yeah of course Ava. you practically <laughs> wrote the game uh okay so we have three people who have finished the game nice uh maybe on the next discussion all of us can finish at least one playthrough of this game because i think we have all enjoyed it and it's not as traumatic as trying to finish Pathologic. Yeah. <laughs> I'll okay. more than likely finish watching a playthrough on the game. Okay, yeah, and you can do that as well, uh, Shelly. Uh, by the way, Shelly, what do you feel about the portrayal of the occult in, in this game? Do you think, I don't know, is it accurate? Does it have a certain charm? Have you perceived anything? The thing about the occult is that each experience, or the person who's experienced the occult is, in my opinion, unique. It's unique from your own perspective. It can be just as unique as a fingerprint. And then you just happen to be like in a melting pot of, of people who with similar experiences. Mm. 
So in different occult traditions, it's a very singular experience. Yes, and, but and like I said, it could also depend on regions depend, and yeah. things that have been affected. Uh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, I have no, not that much knowledge on, on the actual occult, only on what uh, literature writers can say. And I'm pretty sure that it's very different from the actual doing occult stuff. Well, to be honest, and I don't really think there's a right or wrong answer. It's just perceived by your own gnosis. It's what you make of it. Ooh. And in a game that asks you to build your own truth. Personally, uh, I'd love to hear what are your perspectives on that. Would you choose, let's say, the theory that made more sense to you, like Vovkar was, was saying by uh, finding all the pieces of the evidence, or did you say this is the culprit based on who who you dislike the most? What are what what is your way to solve this game? Because there are a few characters who I already like a lot, I, but I'm pretty sure they're kind of guilty. <laughs> I I try to be as logical as possible and try to deduce. But if someone definitely get, got under my skin, I can be very petty. Of course. So, I I wound up, like I do a lot of times with games like this, playing it on a more metal level, where I was thinking, what would a designer do? And so my first thought was, everyone's involved. Uh, because that would be the ultimate sort of twist, and so it, that was kind of my going-in assumption. That's not true. The second thing was, you had a kind of clear set of characters who was, I considered kind of like good guys and bad guys. And again, my thought was, okay, well, the, the bad guys are guilty and the good guys are not. And that also wasn't true. Uh, and I didn't actually discover that until I went back and played through the trial, because again, I got all the evidence, I talked to everyone. And uh, I wound up discovering while I was just kind of messing around that other characters were involved with this conspiracy that I didn't even pick up on on my first playthrough yeah. because I was too busy trying to play it on that kind of level. Yeah. So, it, like, you kind of have to not form these attachments with the characters, good or bad, if you want to actually solve the case. Um, but yeah, and, and I like that. I like that they resisted the urge to either just have good and bad guys or to just say everyone was involved. Definitely. Yeah. was exceptionally was done exceptionally well uh, from a narratological perspective was that there was this classic feel of of narrative to it like bear with me like an ancient greek tragedy would be where you would have i don't know the titans who died in the war that happened time in time immemorial and then there's something fatalistic about this from I, I only played three hours but so there seemed to be something um that made both the good guys and the bad guys indispensable to the story so it is it is you know plot driven and you even have which i thought was great the chorus the demon who appears and sometimes tells you nonsense and some other times tells you something that i imagine is really important but I thought that from um, from a narrative level, I thought it was really, really well done, and it really reminded me of, um, you know, when 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 you read this really huge thing, I don't know, like Medea or something, and you identify a little bit with you, you understand the antiheroes as well as the heroes, and yeah, so so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't get caught up or too invested in in any character. I really. Guess. Oh my god, uh, it, it is so, let's say, rich that the same work has to appeal to such contrasting uh, ways to for players to appreciate it. Uh, you either do it in a more analytical way, while personally, just because the doctor is such a cool guy, I would never accuse him. Because I really mm -hmm. want to uh, rest while I'm playing. I'm like in full analytical mode all day while I'm writing. So really when I finally have a chance to, to play, I cannot continue in that, in that mode. And on the other hand, you mentioned Bobcat that, and, and that is a very um, new pressure, I believe, of sophisticated players like you. 
that you first try to play from the perspective of the game designer. So that is a very good pressure that we are now facing. We, at least some of us, we believe players will always be smarter than us. And if you start with that point and you respect the intelligence of the collaborative internet, then you cannot go to that path that you were mentioning that maybe all of them are, are involved. You actually have to, um, to say, well, I, I will not be able to do a surprise like, I don't know, uh, the ending of Game of Thrones that was actually bad. I, I think I prefer as an author to make something that will not maybe as surprising to everyone, but that it instead will have some intention. Even if it's predictable for some players, but that has a strong resounding intention and sometimes that can work better instead of trying to surprise the whole internet, which we cannot do anymore. Yeah, well, and something that I think the game nailed really well was the investigative gameplay. And I think that really lent to the narrative because it, like the, the problem with investigative gameplay is everybody thinks that they want to be a detective until they realize that they don't know anything about forensics. And so games either have to be a visual novel where it's guiding you by the hand and you are playing more as somebody watching the detective at work, or it has to be one of these games where it basically it's an impromptu co-op game because everyone on the internet has to come together and share their knowledge in the form of walkthroughs so that you can actually solve it. And I think the Paradise Killer does a good job of instead taking out the the bits that we wouldn't know as a player. Like, I, I again, I know nothing about terminal ballistics or blood spatter analysis or analyzing stab wounds. And so Lady Love Dies handles that. And then what I handle is the deduction what based on these facts do we know and i i think that that did wonders for letting the narrative sort of speak for itself because now all of a sudden you're not worried about these the mechanical aspect of it you're worried about is this person telling you the truth or where was this person and now all of a sudden you're analyzing their alibis and you're analyzing them as characters as opposed to analyzing the environment definitely we've mentioned that before that i believe games have to distill and only leave you guys the fun aspects of any activity and not bore you with the boring details in contrast with pathologic well personally i, I did not enjoy sleeping <laughs> in a game i'm like i don't care about that <laughs> so maybe for the next time um we can unfinish the game because I, I can sense how Bobcat and Anne and Alatar are like uh, tre trending. Like, uh, I, I want to say so much, but you guys haven't caught up. <laughs> I really look forward to, to finishing and having at least one working theory. But maybe me in the meantime, we can say uh, who are our favorite characters so far without going into spoilers, naturally. Uh, Dr. Do Doom Jazz. I hung out with Dr. Doom Jazz all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I do like Sammy and Lydia. Sammy and uh, Lydia are, are great, too. Yeah, yeah, the skull bartender. He's like everything I want to be. Yeah. I even have my skull today, like my Star Wars skull kind of thing, Mexican thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like everything for me. I have my bar below uh, downstairs, so yeah, I, I really resonated with the skull as well. What about you, Shelly and Ava? Definitely different from playing Among Us. <laughs> it's not. It's probably a, my my theory is like it's not just going to be one person that's sus. It's probably it's either all of them or someone you never would have expected. Definitely. But do you have so far a favorite character? Not really. Mm. Like I said, I'm watching uh, game throughs and I don't have like the amount of money y'all got because one, diabetes is an expensive disease and two, oh I my. got rent. Of course. Yeah, no worries. So the best thing, the second best thing is to go through playthroughs and watch other people react and see what they do and what happens. Definitely. And I wonder, you, Ava, do you have a favorite character? 
I think uh, Quiz of Math Essex. She's a uh, she's interesting. She's an idol of the Syndicate. I've got a backstory. She used to be part of uh, in the war. She was blessed by a god. Who is she? Is she the trader of secrets? Uh, yes. yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, that that is is yeah, yeah, yeah. I even uh, remembered Mass Effect, where there is also this character who is a trader in secrets. I believe that role is very interesting in games, and I hope that there are more characters like that in games. Definitely. She she has grown bored out of being the idol of the island, right? She has, mm -hmm. and and it's a good motive to get out. <laughs> yeah. I love that there is uh, um, godly motives for murder, like I'm bored, so maybe I destroyed paradise. I'm, I'm bored at being worshipped, yeah, I, I almost get Zeus vibes out of it, of venal gods. Mm -hmm. I, I was mentioning that I also remembered a lot, uh, a book I enjoy a lot, Dancers at the End of Time, by a British author, uh, Moorcock. So I enjoyed that we have this version of, of Paradise who, that is trying to become perfect in, in our game. And similar to that novel where supposedly humanity is so far advanced in technology that they are already um, living in pleasures all day long, you can see that the pursuit of pleasure has made humanity quite vanal. And while there is some vanality here in, in this island, I enjoy that they still don't claim that they are perfect. They are trying to achieve that, that perfection. But I wonder if by achieving their perfection, will they become even more vanal? Uh, would that mean that they just don't get murdered, but they can still kidnap people and later on kill them when they want? Because that's like, that's the that's not part of the problem so far for the islands, right? They 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 see it correctly as kidnapping and murdering the the working class who are regular people. That's not part of their agenda to fix, I believe. No, they, they change islands when a disaster happens. And the disasters are just Eight. against the, the syndicate, not uh, disasters against everyone, right? So, yeah. well, my no. understanding from talking to several of the characters was that they essentially create a shield to keep the demons out and that basically when the demons come in, that starts to rot the island. And so that, that was what caused some of the islands to fail and some of them to move but they need also the people to be sort of uh subjugated so that they will uh praise the gods in order to attract them and so sometimes the islands fail that way um there's it, you can uncover some of this by talking to the architect of the islands mm -hmm. uh she she reveals a lot of kind of the inner workings of how these are created and how they fail mm -hmm. I look forward to speaking with her more. Do you have some thoughts about this, Ida? Yeah, I, I was just um, just hearing you speak. It's very about uh, paradise and how even I mean the whole point of paradise was that in 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 the in the biblical story, right? Is that it's paradise because you don't know you're going to die, but if the gods can die in paradise. You know, then it, it's kind. I guess it becomes ironic, but also kind of. Um, it reminds me of just a un, unformed thought. Uh, have you seen Cabin in the Woods? Of course, yeah, the movie. Um, that's that's kind of the the, the, the structure of, of meta analysis that that comes to my mind with this with this game. Which comparison um, you know, would you make to that movie in case someone hasn't watched it? Right, so the how how the cabin is basically an experiment, and they keep redoing it again and again. Uh, and there are gods. Well, there are humans, and then above that, there are gods. And uh, you know, e everybody can die basically. So nobody. It's it's like a system that can fail and can potentially kill everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so no one is immune 
in, in a way. And then and then I see in in Paradise Killer this really not not veiled critique. Um, it, it's like it, through a Marxist analysis, I think, with the, with the whole factory thing. I think I think really someone you know, um, gave very specific Marxist messages. Um, there was this, even this line, um, um, what was it? Religion and something else and money are drugs. You know, um, so there is kind that of like a culture aspect. Yeah. In this, in this game, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And it's yeah, so I, I thought enjoyable. That was, yeah. Enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you have arrived to the cigarettes, the temple. No. Uh, temple, no. I, I don't want to spoil it to you. Maybe we can comment on that on the next uh, entry. Okay. But there is a cigarette like the temple of... Okay. Um, the... Uh, I'm forgetting the, the religion. The, the name of the religion who built the cigarettes. It's the... Um, Zoroastras in Spanish. Anyway, so there is this real temple, but it's there in Paradise Killer, this real kind of architecture. And th that may be the only puzzle that I've solved that Bobka did not solve, apparently. <laughs> oh, no, so, um, the, the, in the ziggurat, you have these bridges that you have to rotate, and um, I didn't realize that that was a puzzle because I had already unlocked the double jump and the air dash, and so I just jumped over them. Ah, um, okay, okay. I didn't even know that there was yeah. that, those skills. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, well, uh, so... Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, you, you, you've been hoarding the blood crystals. Um, use the foot baths around the island. Uh, there's one at the Mountain Gorge. There's one... I can't remember where the other two are, uh, but those unlock powers for you. That, uh, might be there's one right near the beginning yeah um, and there's one in the apartment areas yes the one in the mountain gorge gives you uh, the meditate ability which reveals all secrets on the map all of them like it, it you see them in real time through objects and everything um, and then yeah the, the other there's a double jump and then there's an air dash where you can kind of jump and that makes navigation so much easier that's why I never used it for fast travel is because I could just scale cliffs Wow, and myself, I was really trying to figure out, figure out the ziggurat puzzle. And that is where I felt the, the strongest vibe, like uh, Ida was mentioning, of this perfect trap with cosmic consequence. It was scary for me being at the ziggurat, knowing the real history behind it and that, well, what, what may have happened to the people who were there in the game? Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I don't want to say because Hiro hasn't <laughs> arrived to that that part. <laughs> Is there any other interesting thing that came to your mind um, that could benefit from having such pros here at the call? One kind of minor thing um, was with the whole jumping and dashing and all that. Um, you don't see this outside of shooters much, but I like the fact I was playing on a controller. I like the fact they map the jump button to one of the shoulder buttons right here, yeah. because it meant the reason why you do that in shooters is so that you can look and jump at the same time. It made the platforming substantially easier as opposed to trying to reach from the stick to one of the face buttons. Okay. I don't know. It was a relatively minor thing. Whenever you're navigating in the air, it actually makes a huge difference. Now, it, the, the game benefits from the fact that you don't have any combat, so you don't have to have, like, you know, guns mapped to your trigger or things like that. But they, they made it so that all of your navigational tools were mapped in such a way that you could still be moving and looking while you were using it. Again, it's a very minor touch, but I really, really liked that on the controller. You know, I think that might be the reason why normally I get horrible motion sickness, um, and I have to stop every hour for a bit, so. Uh, but I I didn't I didn't get that until yeah after the the three hour kind of block. So I guess maybe because I can move and look and it doesn't feel so unnatural maybe. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, you can also play yeah. with your camera sensitivity options. Maybe that could help you know, because I have noticed that by doing mm -hmm. that in other games that helps me. Well, okay. Uh, well, yeah. 
One thing I will note, though, is that I never get motion sick from games until I played Paradise Killer. Um, really? And I think that part of why, yeah, I love the art style, I love the music, but I think the combination of that, like, I was fast moving, I was constantly looking in different directions, and you have a very bright, vivid yeah, color yeah. palette in your eyes, and a very, like, again, I love the music, but it's it's a lot higher pitch than a lot of music in games, and so you kind of have this, this sort of high-pitched sound in your ears yeah. and bright colors all while you're moving. Yeah. And I don't know, something about it just kind of gave me a headache after a little bit. Really? Um, and about how many yeah, hours into gameplay? Okay. Was, I, I can't remember how many hours of constant gameplay. I think I was at about probably the three to five hour mark where I just turned okay. off the music. Okay. I just straight up turned it off and that actually yeah. helped me a little bit. Ah, interesting. But, yeah, like on uh, uh, saturation. It was so much feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, the game is, is, is pretty intense. Like, like you said, Bobcat, like the, just the, the visual stuff, but also like the music is constantly playing, right? I actually, I fell down from the uh, council uh, crime scene on that house, and if you just go to the edge to the, to the sea, yeah, the music stops. So it all, I don't know if, that, if that's intentional, but it, maybe it is, I don't know. But that's like, that's like, that's fat. It, it was almost like a relief because it, it is, even though it's, it, it's no fairly, I don't get, I guess. You know, slow it's a slow game i don't know what that means but it, it's it's still really intense uh, intense on uh, on the mind <laughs> i guess yeah. yeah just a little pro tip i discovered if you bump it down to about 10 or 20 percent where it's kind of in the background you still get to enjoy it and it doesn't bother you nearly as much um the game sets the music really really loud in relation to the other volume yeah it, it is so but, hard to get a uh, sound right because we have to accommodate for players that naturally have so many different uh, settings. For example, when, when the music tends to be too loud, it's because they probably optimized for not players like you, Bobcat, who have really good like sound equipment, but for people who have terrible sound equipment and you just really want the music to sound somewhat well, even with the crappiest of speakers. Sometimes uh, designers opt to do that. Personally, I, I go the other way. I, I prefer to have something subtle because if you go too aggressive on the audio, it can be really jarring. Uh, the thing about the music in this game is not playing with where you're going, it's playing out speakers in the game world. Ah, it's stationary. Yeah. It's true, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. It gets, uh, it gets really loud in some areas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's curious uh, because, go, go ahead, uh, Janus. Now I just I didn't understand Ava. You what you mean? Play now speakers? Yeah, what there's speakers mean? in the game, like uh, sound speakers, like uh, uh, air horns. Look like air horns, I think. Like the places where you pick up the tapes. No. Oh uh, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just to complement with what you were mentioning, Bobcat, I had the, the opposite experience of I, I have to play when, well, I finish with everything else, so I'm constantly tired when I finally arrive to that. And this was one of the few games who that kind of boosted me, gave me the energy, probably because of this stimulation. Yet at the same time, uh, it, it didn't require for me to, I don't know, pull triggers to shoot at things. So it was just stimulating me almost like a TV series without demanding too much of me mechanically. Yeah, like, I, I like the fact that it's it's kind of like, it's part walking simulator, part visual novel, part investigative game. Like that, that whole sort of combination of things really works well and, and lets you kind of sit back and enjoy it while still feeling engaged and still feeling like part of the story. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that this game, I believe, has had uh, some success. I would look eventually for the actual sales figures because I hope that we get more games like this that are more intentional. As Asita said, it, it has this counterculture aspect to it. And at the same time, it has more depth instead of just making, I don't know, 20 islands. Oh, no, you can have one very good island with interesting characters, and that can work. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so. I also think. Like, Go ahead, James. Uh, so, because um, I was uh, there's um, so there's this game called Thief Four, which you might have heard about, but which had 
uh, contextual uh, contextual controls than the old, old, old games. I don't know, they had like total, almost like total free. Like you could go anywhere as long as you could jump up, right? So it's just, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it's not contextual, right? So, and I always, always wonder like, it is, what is the, how does it like not having more like contextual controls change the game, right? Because in contextual controls, you'd, you'd go up to a cliff and then there might be a button prompt, you know, press space to jump, then jump. Um, and 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 uh, in this game, like if if you don't, if you'd had contextual controls, it would probably be obvious where you c would be able to go. So I would, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't be looking around as much. So I wouldn't really be, exp be exp maybe I wouldn't be like exploring the space as much. And so there, it would be much more. I would, I would, I would much rather be. I would probably just be going towards the next objective in a very um, uh, direct, direct fashion, right? So. It, this is actually a game where, I, where where it seems like yeah the not having something contextual just having just complete free running makes sense uh, and also the 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 island itself is very much it is like it is really small and it's, it's almost like a a, a doll house right it's um um it's instead of having just a world that's that's big for being big it's just it it, it just it's a real dense but small world and then you have Maybe it's made to feel bigger than, than, than it really is. It's kind of like, I guess, kind of like Dark Souls. Uh, <laughs> always the go-to example. Uh, it, but, uh, yeah. Like, I think the big difference is just the the size and scope of the world. It, it, like, it, with the contextual button presses and things like that, I totally get what you're saying. And I think that that's usually used in a game that's more linear than they're trying to make you think it is. Um, in a, a, a game where there is definite, you need to go here, you need to do this, but they but they want to seem like the levels are a little bit more open-ended. They want to seem like the world is, is better. And so they don't necessarily want to give you this power, but they'll give you this power for certain situations. Um, and a game that kind of plays with that is Conker's Bad Fur Day. Uh, I love it because you walk up to the scarecrow at the very beginning and he says, see that pad over there? It is context sensitive. And so you push the button on the pad and it's going to give you what you need at that moment. That's almost verbatim what he says. And and it's in a sort of meta way. And the way that the game handles it is when you push that button, you could get just about anything. You could get, you know, basically it's it's whatever the designer thought you might want in order to solve this, this situation. And so sometimes it's like, here, here's a gun turret. Now you have a turret section. Or here, here's a power. Here's a, an item or, or any of a number of things. And so I like the fact they kind of did that in that meta sense because Conquer's Bad Fur Day, despite being kind of open world, it, it doesn't have a big enough open world to sustain like Death Stranding or something like that, where it just gives you all these powers and it tells you here, now go traverse the world. And so I think that's why Thief 4 did that. And I think that's why Paradise Killer didn't. It's just because Thief 4 was nowhere near as open-ended as they kind of wanted you to think. I'd love to see now that mechanic in Conquer's Bad for Day, like you mentioned. I wish that button existed. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, in some years, maybe. Ooh, in decades, I believe. There's also like the, the level design is... Uh, there's also something very intentional with where you are directed. So if, if you go somewhere, uh, this usually is, it usually leads to somewhere else where you might have been before. So it's it's all everything is sort of like uh, I guess circular or whatever you'd call it. Like if you go to the council, you could go down and then you get to the bottom and then you get up. And then if you go to the like the the, uh, the council house, that's yeah the the I think it's the goat shrine on top of it. If you go yeah. up there, you're directed down again to where you were again. So it's yeah that's very intentional. And um, I don't know what exactly would what the effect is, but uh, yeah, it's, I uh, can tell you that the level design. Um, helps us because it drives you to explore the island. You are constantly making these circular movements and you can fall or you can get sidetracked and that helps you in order to find new things. The, the island is not, let's say, organized in an architectural way. If it were really that way, I don't know, you, you would have uh, the temple, the cigarette at the center or at the top of the island and that's not the case or you would have the um, similar aspect, uh, but it's mostly organized in a circular way. So uh, as players, we are constantly arriving to something called the uh, winnies 
co coined by Disney, and that is points of interest that drive you to explore. Mm -hmm. And that is so good because, uh, like a person who always gets lost in real life and in games, it, it helps me that I always get lost, but in interesting ways. <laughs> it, we, we were talking about it before. I would have loved a compass in this game. It would have been so great. I get lost so much in general. Like, I am terrible with directions. And if they had just given me a compass at the top, I would have been so much better off because I could go to the map in the, in the computer and see where I was going, but... I just wandered because I got lost all the time and so Zelda I finally has just figured out, okay, us. this is how it goes. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I even got to know the word in English first, compass, than in Spanish, brújula, because I didn't know that it was a real thing that could direct you. You, you don't find oh, yeah. compasses in real life that often, at least myself, I don't. It is an useful object. <laughs> it, um, yeah, I mean, it, it... I totally get that gamers have kind of gotten spoiled on having here's a mini map that shows you exactly where you're pointed and it has an objective marker and just in case you missed that there's an arrow up at the top of the screen and you have a compass and you have this and that so that you don't get lost and it's going to hold your hand the whole way. I like the more organic methods of, of travel. I just think that if you're going to have that technique you need to give the player a little bit of something to play off of. In theory, the AR vision helps a bit for that, but just a bit. Yeah. Well, because the reason why you don't have objective markers in this game is because it's not a linear game. Exactly. Like, there is no connecting the dots or anything like that. You're, you're going to talk to all these different people. And I also like that the AR gives you the little exclamation point above people's heads if they have something new to say. Mm -hmm. That, that was is really, really useful. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. It's mostly, admittedly, it's mostly just because whenever I was exploring trying to get 100% completion, I was having trouble getting lost. If I had just stuck to the main story, I probably wouldn't have had any problem. Makes a lot of sense. Transfixed yeah. by how pretty the game was, so that's, I think that's why I was getting lost, because I was like, ooh, a cliff, the sea, oh, a mountain, the pyramid. I went to the pyramid three times for no reason, I couldn't open the door. But it was just really pretty to climb all the way to the top, and I don't know. So there's, it's, it's definitely an experience, I think. I, I really enjoyed yeah. that. That has permeated a lot in, in games to make sure that there's always something pretty. Obsidian, for example, also does that well. The more that, the more recent their games, I believe, the more that happens. And really, Disney experimented a lot, like Walt Disney, the founder, experimented a lot in order to get this sensation in the parks. And fortunately, since Disney eventually made some games that arrived to us, and that happens a lot. If, if you can see the games before the Super Nintendo, we did not get that that much. That, that mostly started to happen on the Super Nintendo when Disney got some games around. Uh, usually games before this, I don't know, they, they would be so utilitarian because mostly we were constrained by resources, naturally. But yeah, I enjoy that now games can allow you to get lost and enjoy it. Well, and especially in kind of the mid-2000s, gaming went through a really brown phase where everything was very muted and uh, again, brown and gray and things like that. And it's nice to see more and more games kind of bucking that trend. Now they went the opposite direction where for a while every game had to be bright magenta. Um, and so that that got a little bit grating after a while, but I'm glad to see that other colors are being introduced. And like even just the design of Shinji in this game, I love his kind of like, he's bright blue and he's got you know pink all over him and things like that. And um, and yeah, like that, that was kind of my introduction. I was just, just like, oh, okay, I'm gonna enjoy this. Yeah, and he's got some color and some personality. Because he he's is a wild boy. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Ella? I said he's a wild boy. He definitely <laughs> I, is. I mean, he is I, naked, I like right? Shinji. He's just censored. Yeah, he is. I, I yeah. think it really, it's really say, saying something when, uh, like, uh, like brightly, like bright pink letters are uh, doesn't stand out. It's like it is. It stands out enough that you're okay. Here's a here's a uh, an, an um, alternative path or a winny or whatever. Uh, but it, the, it makes sense with the aesthetic of the game, so that's that's nice. It's it's. Well, I think even though like you can get lost in exploring and such, I think this game, at least at least compared to the games I usually play, this game is really focused. Um, 
like the, the like the dialogue um it's i swear i saw it's like i saw there's there's like a, a response from one a person i talked to and it was like it was like three words in each sentence and dun, dun, dun. yeah and it's like it's like a response something and then he mentioned the next thing we would like start to talk about or whatever like it's instead of like if you play like you know, a classic larp geek you'd, you'd ask a character about something he'd respond and then you're maybe back to the like the out like the, at the start and you're, you're just you're just asking um these tangential questions it doesn't really it, it doesn't really flow anywhere right so instead of going like uh a b a c a d these conversations like a b c d like if 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 uh, a b c d is like a a, a a subject or whatever it feels it just flows and it's really fast and i just i just love that so yeah i have not played a lot of dialogue heavy games like these or investigative games so mm. i enjoy that the the stories um are very vibrant in our current era of, of games because they are becoming more uh they're becoming deeper i believe this game naturally is not bigger than skyrim but it is deeper at least for me i feel that well and like one of the things that i really enjoyed about this was I, i've seen a few people kind of talking about it but the, the the whole aesthetic of the game is very reminiscent of vaporwave and vaporwave was a response to the kind of consumerism capitalism of the 80s it's it's kind of a, a parody of that it takes like you oftentimes hear people talk about music that would be played in a shopping mall in the 1980s being sort of remixed into these these into this musical style and I, i've heard a few people talking about how in this game the vaporwave style is kind of a critique of the of classical literature and how you have this paradise but it is a sort of gilded paradise it is you know once you get even the slightest bit beneath the surface it's hideously corrupt and everybody is trying to kill each other and I, I like the fact that even by choosing that particular aesthetic, it makes a statement about the game and kind of tells you something more and deeper about it, um, just with the, the, the style and the musical choices and things like that. Yeah, and that's it is fine. unapologetically vaporwave. Like it is straight in your face vaporwave. Like even the the skins you can put on your computer, like they have some of the most traditional vaporwave types looks to them. That's amazing. Yeah, Palm I trees, believe. pink, blue gold all that yeah in terms the of statues yeah demographics maybe there now that can be nostalgic for players because we knew that era and it is refreshing funny to see it now in a game portrayed in an intentional helpful way because it's not just a parody it, it actually makes a point like you mentioned Bobcat. at least for me i perceive that this paradise path for perfection is very banal that will be the final goal to be the perfection of banality something like that yeah well and i mean the the, the style is is very sort of cynical and ironic and I, I i enjoy that but the game itself is still somewhat optimistic it's still somewhat hopeful and i i like the fact that even with having dark themes and even with having this sort of undercurrent of cynicism throughout it it never loses sight of the fact that what the judge and Lady Dove, Lady Love Dies rather is trying to do is to create something that is better, you know. Now, in relation to what, they're still kidnapping people and slaughtering them for the gods, but, you know, in relation to that particular sort of world. Yeah, it's like an optimism, but with, I don't know, if everyone were like Oscar Wilde or something like that, like recognizing, yeah, it's possible to improve, but I'm okay like this as well. There are in this state so many characters. So maybe we can grab this up and I'm excited that everyone wants to get to the ending of this game. I'm pretty sure that just one playthrough is enough for us to be able to comment our theories and what we enjoy the most. Uh, thank you again uh, for recommending it to us, Ava. Uh, I was very excited when I read your review about it. And now with all of your expertise, I appreciate it even more. No problem at all. Mm -hmm. So see you guys in two weeks. I hope you have a great Sunday. You too. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.